Thank you very much, uh, Fiona, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I woke up this morning to the worst constitutional political crisis in my lifetime, which affects the future of my children. And I'd just like to start by abusing the hospitality here. Uh, how do I move that? Oh, yeah, hang on. Because I blame Oxford, personally. We, my children's future is being determined by the uh, political struggle between two members of Oxford University's Bullingdon Club. And that may sound like gratuitous offence, which was done actually against Oxford much better by T.S. Eliot, who said, Oxford's very pretty, but I don't like to be dead. Um, but I, I'm going to back it up with some evidence because I wrote a letter to the Financial Times about a week ago uh, because I was intrigued why it is that my... Uh, heir to the throne, my Prime Minister, my future Prime Minister, my Archbishop of Canterbury and various other members of the Cabinet all not only went to Oxford but to the same school. What is it about the social apartheid of the UK which infects all of our major institutions? And I did an analysis, you can have a look at this, but basically if you apply to Cambridge, I looked at the Cambridge admissions figures, um, if you went to an independent school, you have the same A-level results, you have an 85% better chance of getting in than if you go to a comprehensive school. And this lies at the root, the social determinants, this inbuilt bias to our system, as alive as the caste system in India, uh, which underpins a lot of the political crisis that we find ourselves in today, and we don't talk about it very much, and it wrecks all of our institutions. Okay, now my five tips for... Uh, people, first we have to resist hostility to RCTs, which I see everywhere. This is where I was an SHO at UCL, and when I started uh, on the obstetric wards, uh, all primary gravita women were, had seven days of bed rest, uh, there was routine episiotomy, uh, lots of babies got formula milk top-ups, and we all encourage the mothers to prone sleep. And all of that is highly dangerous medicine. And if it wasn't for Ian Chalmers and uh, Enkin and Pierce, who wrote Effective Care and Pregnancy in Childbirth, we would be still doing that kind of stuff. And why the evidence... OK, they, I, I know David Sackett got the Gerdner Prize, but why has the evidence-based leadership movement not been given a Nobel Prize? Can somebody tell me why? Because of the impact that it has had on lives being saved. Um, Bill Silverman, some of you will remember, the Road to Hell is paper with good intentions. He did the first ever RCT in perinatal care. And I thought about him recently because of this. Born too soon, uh, everyone loves a magic bullet. And there are lots of babies born too soon. And people came up with the idea that we should inject many women in the world with antenatal steroids because it improves lung maturity and that's going to save a lot of preterm deaths. And so the UN Commission on Life-Saving Communities said this will save up to 400,000 lives and Bill and Melinda Gates said let's get behind this and, and roll it out to millions of women. And I thought as a neonatologist this is actually daft because we're not comparing like with like. Injecting people in London or in Boston is not the same in hospitals where you can't do the most basic routine care. And I wondered whether preterm deaths would actually fall in the absence of special care or whether sepsis would go up. And we were lambasted. In fact, I was pinned up against the wall by a well-known professor who said, because of you, thousands of babies are going to die because you're blocking the scale up of this drug. And they wrote letters in saying how safe it was and how fantastic. I said, wait for the evidence. And there was a multi-century trial going on, and it published last year. And we wrote Kishu Azard and I a commentary. And basically, it showed it pushed neonatal mortality rates up when you scaled up steroids in low-income settings and increased maternal infection rates by 45%. Now, I, you know, I can be a bit smug about this, but the reality is if you don't do trials and you don't listen to the evidence and the data, and particularly in different populations, you're going to run into trouble. Because preterm care, above all, you can't magic bullet. It's about being holistic and dealing with all the needs of the, the patients. We learnt this to our costs in the West, that you damage babies a lot. Right, the second tip is, these days, 
uh, it's much more now about complex interventions and wicked problems. Um, I was brought up uh, drinking cola. Uh, I smoked camels because more doctors smoke more than any other cigarettes. We're all getting fat and we're all eating and drinking too much sugar. We know all of this and these are the problems that we face. Uh, our children are getting fatter. We're all going to die of heart attacks and strokes and depressed and anxious and breathing bad air. And that's just me. Um, <laughs> and so I think these are the challenges for young doctors today. And so the kind of trials that we did of single drugs and the like in the past may be very different for behaviour change and complex interventions. So quality of delivery care, this is in southern Nepal, a regional hospital serving three million, that's obstetric care for you. And of course, when you look at the relationship between institutional delivery and maternal mortality, uh, and you push up institutional delivery as they've done in India, you barely change the mortality rate. Why? Because the quality of care is really rubbish uh, in many hospitals. And this is another wicked and complex problem. And dealing with poor people and reaching out to the poorest, which remains a massive issue in developing country medicine, is very complicated. It's not just about distributing vitamin A tablets. Um, this is another thing, the sanitation campaign, why so many people still defecate in the open. Um, Bill Gates said we must reinvent... Actually, I've got, actually I, work for w <laughs> I work for WHO, so I'm being very indiscreet here. Just This is all Chatham House rules. Um, uh, and Bill Gates is a wonderful man. He gives us most of our money, actually. But, uh, but he said reinvent the toilet. He came up with a fantastic green toilet. The trouble is that as Gram Vikash in India has taught us, it takes about 14 months for Gram Vikash to mobilise a community before people commit to take up water and sanitation work. So technology and the social must go together in complex interventions. It's not just about technologies and bullets. And another wicked problem, we're up to 1.35 degrees of warming uh, this particular year. Everything's going off the charts. Uh, there's heat waves, there's devastation to food security and harvests, massive drought in India. Um, uh, the Arctic is disappearing, the Antarctic is cracking up, uh, and we're all talking about Brexit. I mean, this is an existential threat to all of us. We're all aware of this. The health consequences are massive, and we all want to worry about Nigel Farage. Uh, wicked problems. That's the definition I picked out of the book. Incomplete, contradictory, changing requirements, complex interdependencies. So that's what we've got to struggle with as epidemiologists. Now, mixed methods are not music versus art. We both like both of them. And I do pick bones with Trish and with Ray Pawson, who've written a lot of fantastic stuff, actually, about qualitative care. But I, I draw the line when they use uh, defending qualitative studies to knock randomised controlled trials because it's music and art. They're both two sides of a better life and we have to defend both. So let me give you one example. This is health education in Nepal. We did a trial 20 years ago, actually published in the BMJ, which showed absolutely no impact whatsoever on anything when we gave health education to poor mothers from the slums of Kathmandu. And then we heard about the WARMI project in Bolivia, which used women's groups coming together once a month and seemed to have an effect, but had never been exposed to a randomised trial. So we set up a trial in Makwampur, Nepal, uh, covering about uh, nearly a quarter of a million population. We had a whole number of clusters. I just learned about cluster trials. I read all the checklists. We used a, a, a community action cycle and we had a big impact. We showed a 30% impact in the areas where you have women's groups on neonatal mortality, which really surprised us because we didn't think that the coverage would be anything like high enough. And so we decided we had to replicate this because no one believed us. Um, and so we tried to scale up in India. We've done two trials in Malawi. We've done two trials in India, blah, blah, blah. In the India one, 
we actually had an even bigger impact, a 45% effect in years two and three of running these uh, participatory learning groups with women's groups on neonatal mortality. And then we looked at the data from uh, Bangladesh, where we looked at a big trial in half a million population, and what did we find? No impact whatsoever. And that negative trial was extremely important because when we had to think about it and analyze why it wasn't working, we realized that we got the dose wrong. Uh, we thought that the coverage here was simply not adequate. We didn't get enough pregnant women into our groups. We have to do something about that. Let's scale up even more, get a higher dose of women's groups covering the population. And if we haven't got that right, uh, it, and, and if there's no impact, then it might be due to some other characteristics of the way women interact in very conservative Muslim societies. We tripled the coverage and we showed a 38% impact on mortality. So my point is that when you do the, the meta-analysis, as Audrey Prost and others did when we published this, and you look at the trials that we did, these are seven of them, and we've done two more since, the, uh, where you've got more than 30% of women participating in the groups showed that you can have a big impact on neonatal mortality. And the same, actually, interestingly, on maternal mortality, although that was not a primary hypothesis of any of our trials. But we have lots of qualitative data to back it up. And, and that, oh, this is my joke. You have to laugh at this, I say, because most people have fallen asleep by this stage because it's, you know, the community. Um, a new PCR method for DNA, uh, participation in the community for reproductive health, which reaches out to women and children who do not attend health services. Um, good, you laughed a bit, so that's <laughs> encouraging. So, but the mixed methods comes in because if you do process evaluations and get social scientists on board, you start to unpick why this might work. Ideally, you start with a theory of change. So we know that knowledge sharing and individual behavior has changed from a lot of the results of these trials. We know that social support mechanisms are extremely important in all kinds of ways. And this throws up another hypothesis about support reducing obstetric complications, because I am a follower and devotee of Michel Odor, who talks about the hormone of love, uh, oxytocin, which, as you know, is the great social hormone that makes you loving and kind. It also makes you very violent and xenophobic. I think, I think oxytocin levels were very high last night. Um, and decision-making and political advocacy. What's been a pure joy to see is the subversive element of women's groups in Bangladesh, because most of these women have gone on to stand for election and stir it all up, much to the imam's disappointment. Um, so empowerment and critical consciousness emerges from this, and you get that from mixed methods. My fourth tip, how do you get research into policy and implementation? Now, this is the slide I want laminated and stuck on my funeral stone because uh, I took all our evidence to the World Health Organization and they gave us a kicking for about 18 months, put us through the grade process, like it or not. It was very difficult, but then they wrote an independent report which had this recommendation. And at the end of that, I've got the imprimatur of the WHO and not a single ministry in the world can contest those results now. And I strongly, you know, it took 15 years to get all this stuff, but it makes a big difference. And so thinking about that, actually, I liked them so much, I joined the organization. I sound like the Gillette guy, don't I? Right, and the other argument is you can scale this up. This is Artie Ahuja, who is Secretary of Health and Welfare in Orissa State in India. She just liked, we told her about all this research and she loved it. And she said, well, I'm going to scale it up. And we said, well, we'll have to find donors to support you. And she said, no, no, I'll use the Indian budget. And she's scaled up, I think it's now 65,000 women's groups across the whole of Orissa State, which is 44 million people. Um, finally, uh, if we're getting involved in all kinds of complex, wicked problems like climate change, we should not be afraid to be honest brokers. Uh, that's a, a quote from Roger Pielka, who says, you don't just stand on the sides and be very purist about p-values and all the rest of it. You have to get engaged at some point and get involved in some of these debates. And certainly in the whole climate change debate, health has to be 
uh, and doctors and health professionals have to be in there. My final tip is last slide, keep calm, keep going. Um, my only, I think the reason I'm still in research is because I'm a bit dogged. Um, I failed to get my first three major grants when I was appointed at UCL and I just kept going and then I got a 20,000 grant and that enabled me to get some stuff going in, in Nepal. And then I had a fantastic period of success and getting big grants and all that. And then it all dried up because of some nasty reviewer at the Wellcome Trust. And so I'm now at WHO, which is, uh, that's quite good, isn't it? Never does one door close, but another opens. But I've got about six protocols I still want to see implemented. So I'm going to find devious ways of self-funding myself in order to, to get them done. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. I think that's 15 minutes. <laughs>